using music to teach the whole child, the body, heart, and to learn new skills and to build new acumen. As the year goes on, I get closer and closer. We can always touch. It's not. When you get that, then you get a lot more excited about being around children. Normal, in a sense, and with all of the changes. Or how you can transform your own business. On developing the whole time, social, emotional. Traditional route of teaching young people. How to set boundaries, because this little victim here needs to know how to. Very well. So they use that term. I sometimes expanded them to go up to 40 minutes. See, all of those things in education, of course, those things are important. Student is going to our heads and our lungs. The affirmations in the mirror for about two minutes. What did you do in order to get yourself going? This is amazing. It happens what seems to happen quite a bit in our school. For the families to come and they, uh, is that really for the child or is it for us, or for the parents? And doing new things for our brain. Who's orchestrating everything in this universe? Which parts of the brain uh, are used? Based on that map that we have. With your smiling face. At all, thank you very much for allowing me to join you. Namaste to you, my friends. Hello and welcome everyone who has tuned in to our early childhood global spotlight talk show. I am Atul Tyagi from India. I'm also a co-founder of a preschool chain in the name of Wow Kids, having more than 150 centers spread across 20 states of our country. Today, friends, today let me begin with congratulating all the participants of Tokyo Olympics 2020. Friends, today was the closing ceremony of this historic event and we must congratulate the government and people of Japan for organizing this Olympics during these difficult times. A lot of records have been created, a lot of champions have emerged and once again new chapters in the history of sports have been written. We are really proud of our sports and athletic representatives who created new records in this global event. All right, friends, if you're just new here, we do these spotlight talk shows usually every Sunday, 9 p.m. my time, which is Indian Standard Time. It's 11.30 a.m. in the United States, which is Eastern Standard Time. The point of these shows is to simply inspire others and share more and more knowledge on early childhood. And if you have a questions, during the show, feel free to comment. We would be happy to take them up during the show. Folks, today we have one of my very favorites amongst our global community, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. And we have also been joined by Marion Herman, who is moderator of our community. Hi, Marion. Hello. All right, before we get started, let me give a very small introduction of Rebecca to our guests. Um, Rebecca A. Wiener, STEM Masters in Education, is a dynamic educator passionate about helping young children, families, and teachers connect, communicate, and learn with confidence. She specializes in play-based enrichment, parent coaching, and development, developmental interventions for children with diverse abilities. Rebecca works with children, parents, and teachers virtually at home, at school, and in the community. Rebecca's education and experience makes learn, play, grow unique. She earned a master's degree in education, in education and completed a residency in Rice University School Literacy and Culture Program and a fellowship in leadership education for autism and neurodevelopmental disabilities. Rebecca has 15 plus years experience in teaching early childhood educators and special children and inclusive education and consulting with families, schools, therapists and community organizations. She created Learn, Play, Grow to support children, families and teachers with innovation and compassion. You can learn more about Rebecca and learn, play and grow at her website which is www.learnplaygrowconsulting.com where you will find a guide to connecting, communicating and learning through power of play 
and many resources to support parenting with purpose, transforming behavior and empowering development for young children of all abilities. Welcome, Rebecca, to our Spotlight Show. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Great. It's an honor to have you again on this show. We also have our very own Marian Herman, who doesn't know her on this group. She is the moderator of our global community and also the founder of our internationally respected Music with Mar trademark program. Over to Marian for this to take this lovely show ahead. Well, good. Uh, hello to everyone. I used to say good morning, and then I realized that's from my perspective. So, whatever time of day, I hope that you are embracing it. Um, so, Rebecca, good to have you back. I know we um, often go back and forth with the private messages on. Um, comments. I don't know if you know that at all, but sometimes I will write to Rebecca and say, what do you think of this? Um, before putting it out there. Uh, good morning, Prana. Good to see you. Um, Hi, Prana. How are you? you? Um, Very nice to see you, Prana. So um, let's begin by give, you giving us an explanation of what a structured question is. Absolutely. I am passionate about structured choice because structured choice helps parents and teachers communicate expectations without being directive. In a structured choice, one party defines finite options and the other party is empowered to choose. What this most often looks like in our education and parenting scenarios is that the parents or the teachers define the finite options and the children are empowered to choose. Here's a real life example. Sometimes we ask our kiddos, what do you want for snack? And we secretly hope that they're not gonna choose the leftover candy from the birthday party, but we leave that open as an option. In a structured choice, we can say, it's time for snack. Would you like apples, bananas, or celery and ranch? We define the finite options and they are empowered to choose among them. That is very good. And I know we also do that a lot in relationships. And a lot of times that's a problem between a husband and wife because the wife doesn't want to cook. But instead of saying, can we go out to dinner? She says, what would you like to do for dinner tonight? And the answer is, I, I'd like to sit right here and have you give me something. Um, <laughs> so uh, also uh, giving a structured choice to children, like you know, would you like to have a banana or you would like to have a take a you know take this apple? Is actually you are empowering them to make a choice yeah. rather than forcing them to choose what you want to. So you know, once if you try That's to force it. them. If you try to force upon them, they feel uh, frustrated and they it builds on their anger. It leads to a lot of behavior issues. And I think that's a very, very uh, important topic that we have chosen for today, which is going to help all the you know educators as well as parents, because this is something which is really, really important for management of children, for their learning and for their betterment, in fact. You're absolutely oh, right. oh, Sorry. Overall, um, when we model this with children, that's how they're going to treat other people. So the earlier we give these types of choices structured, um, then they do. The first too thing that is coming to my mind right now, my children are watching television. So usually what we do in the evening during this time, because it's time for them to go to the bed, we tell them, are you going to go to the bed now or you're going to go to the bed after five minutes. So they generally tend to choose after five minutes. Okay, so that we are giving them a... Uh, so they have chosen. So it will be their accountability and they will agree after five minutes, maybe after 10 minutes. But if I tell them, I'm closing the, the television right away. So that's, mm -hmm. that's going to give them, you know, that they start shouting and they start, you know, saying, no, I don't want to go. What, what I, why, why do you do this with me every day? It leads to a very long conversation and sometimes yeah. leave nowhere. So they, they feel very frustrated and they may, you know, just uh, end up going to the bed in a very, very bad uh, mood. So very, very important to give them a structured choice. 
please. Yes, and I feel that structured choice is a great way to honor choice. I think we as adults, because we are uncomfortable with children's big feelings, we cheapen choice and we often follow what we wish were a direction with a question. It's time for bed, okay? Does mm. that mean that if it's not okay, it's not time for bed? In a structured choice example, we could say, it's time for bed. Are you going to slither like a snake or crawl like a crab to bed? This communicates that the child will go to bed and it gives them the option to choose on what terms. We've all had that student or that child that when told to do something will dig their heels in and refuse just because there's no element of choice. Structured choice prevents the power struggle by clearly communicating the expectation and also empowers the child to be able to choose on what terms they do it. That's right. And now I know I wrote a song called Choices. And in the song, it says I can choose to take uh, my nap on the floor or in my bed. And then it also says I choose to laugh. I choose to cry because mm -hmm. teacher, you are also in charge of the choices of what emotion you have. Right. So yeah. some things we can give choices and something like that, you know, do you want to wear your sneakers or would you like to wear your flip flops? You know, mm -hmm. you can choose that. But there's other things that you can choose. Like you will hold my hand. We're crossing the street. So explain the difference of when so you some have to be struck. Yeah, you do. And some things are not a choice. Now, we could structure the things that are not a choice in a choice way. We need to hold hands to stay safe in the parking lot. Will you hold my right hand or my left hand? Sometimes we don't have time to say that. It's an emergency scenario in which we can say, it's my job to keep you safe. We're holding hands. We take the child by the hand and we just keep moving. Sometimes in reality, we don't have time to have a whole conversation, in which case right. we do what we need to do. My goal in sharing the strategy of structured choice is to help reframe the mindset we have about how we communicate and how we empower children so that we as adults can be intentional about how we can share those expectations and what terms we can give children to choose among. Yes, that's so important. I mean, my, my daughter, when she was younger, if I just, if we just say to children too, it's another thing like time to go and just yank mm -hmm. them. So you have to give it a choice that lets, like a tool saying, you know, with the going to bed, um, we know what, we don't like it. You don't like when you're in the middle of something, time to go, what, can I finish my steak? You know, so mm -hmm. same thing with children. So you go to the child and say, we're going to be leaving. And how do you, how do you structure that, Rebecca? Right, and you raise a really interesting point. Our children have a right to their thoughts, feelings, and experiences. It's okay for them to want to eat cupcakes for breakfast or keep playing their favorite game or not turn the TV off and go to bed. It's okay to want those things. Yes. Sometimes yeah. those thoughts, feelings, and experiences don't change what's actually going to happen. But one of my goals in sharing structured choice is that we hold space for the possibility that children may think, feel, or experience this, and that's okay. And this strategy can empower adults to be a little more comfortable with their own discomfort about children's discomfort. Mm. That yeah. That's a very, very... <laughs> yes, but like... You, so have to, you have to actually put them, put yourself in their shoes yes. and think that, see, see, I'm... I, it is not going to make a very big difference if they go to bed after five minutes, after another five minutes of watching television. It's not going to make a big difference rather than I annoying them and then in turn annoying myself. So <laughs> it's better to think and, you know, empower them. I'm empowering them to make their own choice and they feel empowered. They feel a sense of responsibility. They, they have their own self-respect intact. They have their own choice, it, you know, because I'm giving them a choice from something that they want. And yes. So that is... That's, if, that's excellent, I think. Very, very uh, amazing point that you've mentioned, I think. I would like often, to... Sorry, go ahead. 
often what happens is instead of giving the direction, we ask, okay, and then we end up in a protracted power struggle in which we try to convince the child to want what we want them to want. Again, it's okay for them not to want it. The goal is to give them a choice on which terms to do the thing. So for example, I've heard a mother say, do you wanna take this upstairs? And the answer is no, I do not wanna take it upstairs. If I wanted to take it upstairs, I would have taken it upstairs. Do you want me to take it upstairs? In which case, what language could you use to communicate that? But we trick our children when we ask them, do you want what I want you to guess what I want? That's a lot of mental gymnastics and it's detrimental to our relationship. We as adults need to take responsibility for what we mean to say and we need to empower our children to take responsibility for making and following through on choices. And structured choice allows that to happen. Yeah, Atul, would you put up what Prana wrote again so Rebecca could yeah. read it and comment? I'm actually on my choices phone. I cannot equals, read the print. Yes. Yeah. So, choices equals voices. When we allow children to pick a choice, it allows them to be heard, which is one of the basic needs of the emotional brain. And that's Prana. Yes, you are right on target. Absolutely. Choice is voice. I love that. Yeah, Prana always comes up with those catchy, catchy phrases there. Um, anyway, let's go back to the um, teaching the child, let's use that word, how to pivot. You know, so they're playing and it's time to go home. So rather than just say, okay, you're done, let's go. How do you handle that? Well, transitions can be a time of great stress. So we can structure the transition. We can give a yes. 10 minute warning, a five minute warning, a two minute and a one minute warning. For young children, time is not a concrete concept. So we can use a visual timer. I always encourage teachers and parents, when it's time to go, make sure that you are ready to go so that you're not telling your child, we need to go while you're packing up the diaper bag or picking up your purse be ready to do what you're asking your child to do with you. And it's okay if they don't accept the choice to tell them that this is what's happening and take them by the hand and go. What often happens is we kind of sabotage transitions by not being intentional. And then we end up again in this protracted power struggle, which by the way, our children will remember the next time you say it's time to go that the last oh, time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We didn't really have to go. See, so. Nobody, I, I personally feel nobody likes that somebody should give me directions. And that too, mm -hmm. you know, 20 times in a day, 50 times in a day. And children won't. Absolutely. And so, so it is very important to give them those structured choices to make the right choice. And I, you know, once again, they feel empowered. Yes. They feel so, empowered. They feel that their <clears throat> interest and self-respect is maintained. We are giving them an opportunity. And we, and usually, you know, this happens with me very often that I tell them, okay, so if you are going to take 10 more minutes, make sure that you play and come back home 10 minutes so that I can let you go again tomorrow during the same time. Mm. So they feel there is a sense of, uh, I will say, responsibility. I have to do this in 10 minutes and I have to come back so that I get the opportunity. They try to win the faith of the parent again. So Interesting. You know, it's, it's a mutual, uh, yes. I will say, I don't know what word to use, but it's a mutual respect that I am giving you another 10 minutes. Please keep your word. So that's something yeah. that, you know, uh, and they do. And they do, thankfully, because they right. know that, yes. They're learning how to negotiate. Um, or to accept I, boundaries, because exactly. sometimes things are not negotiating. And I had, you, go ahead. So I had put up this Peter Alsop the clock just because I wanted people to be aware. It's a great resource for what we're talking about. Peter Alsop was on a couple of months ago and he wrote a song called The Clock. Now, when I heard it, when my daughter was little, it was one of those moments for me because what the song teaches is Children have different clocks than we do. And that's what you were just saying. They don't understand 10 minutes, five minutes. So when an adult says, um, all right, I got to go, um, I, the kid's going, but wait, I need more time. 
Um, right. they, they don't understand that. So it's important. And that's a great song. I think, Rebecca, you would love that song. If you, if I can't you, wait to check it out. Peter Alsop, he's part of our group. But um, we have Preeti saying um, that she agreed with Prana and that the choices equals voices, giving our children opportunities to make a decision. Now, you know very well, Rebecca, that we could use all the wonderful tactics. We've learned <laughs> wonderful master's degrees. However, there are going to be children that even though we do our best, no. Mm -hmm. So they said, no, I don't, you know, it will be my thing. So sometimes it happens, of course. So yes. what? So what do you do? So when children refuse the choices that are offered, which is frankly, they're right. Again, their thoughts, their feelings, and their experiences matter. I use two strategies. The first one, a tool builds on what you were talking about, trust. I'll repeat the choices. Your choices are carrots or tomatoes. I trust you to make a decision. And this word trust not only communicates empowerment, it also returns responsibility. I use the word trust when it's time to clean up. I trust you to clean up the dress up before we take out the puzzle. Notice I did not say you need to clean up the dress up. Notice yes. I did not start cleaning up the dress up and do it for the child. I communicated that I trust the child to do it. And that is so much more empowering. Now still, even with trust, sometimes children aren't going to accept things. In which case I use a second strategy called you choose or I choose. Your choices oh, are wow. tomatoes or carrots you choose or I choose. Now it's very, very important to note, this is I never, like that. ever, ever like that a threat or a punishment. We are not trying to control the child. Instead, we are reiterating, these are the choices. And if you choose not to choose, which is making a decision in and of itself, I will choose for you. What happens when parents try to use this strategy is that they revert back to the negotiation and the rationalization yeah. If you're going to tell a child that you will choose for them, you best be prepared to make the choice and keep going. Mm. Fantastic. I think that that's a very, I, I'm going to try that. Definitely. I'm sure it's going to work. I. It looks like, because there are, there are often uh, those days and those times when they, you know, my children will refuse that I don't want to do this or I don't want to go with you. I, mm -hmm. I did better be with my friends, whatever. So right. I think that's a very good way to give them either you choose out of these choices or I will choose for you. And I've had so. experiences where I've needed to scoop children up. They say no. I say you choose or they choose. They throw themselves on a speed bump in a parking lot, at which point I will scoop them up and tell them you're really sad and my job is to keep you safe. I'm going to keep your body safe and walk you or carry you to XYZ place. We're always validating that they have a right to their feelings. Again, those feelings don't always change what we're going to do, but they still have a right to them. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was um, training with Dr. Becky Bailey with the I Love You Rituals, mm -hmm. and we were doing a training together at a school I was teaching at. And one of the moms said, what do I do when my two-year-old doesn't want to leave. And Beth, Becky's like, you're the parent. Right. Well, you need to remember that you're the adult in charge. And if the child is being really obstinate, Becky said, you look at the child and you remember that. And you say, we are leaving. Leaving is not a choice, but you can either walk or I'll carry you. And if they still refuse, you just pick them up and carry them and keep remembering you're the adult, you're in charge. Perfect. Yep. And all the parents were like, what? You know, like you would think that people think of that naturally. So that leads into the next question. So is there a difference between using these strategies in a preschool setting where you have an audience and doing it at home where it's just one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, however children you have. Great questions, great questions. That is a really great question. And I am confident that the strategy works across settings. Sometimes it's implementation is a little bit different. 
sometimes in a classroom setting, we get to you choose or I'll choose a little bit sooner than we might at home because we have however many other children that we're responsible for yes. being gentle leaders for. Correct. But I think it's a really powerful model for the other children to see and hear structured choice. They are watching and they are learning and they are realizing the next time it's time to clean up, I'm going to be given a choice. So I'm going to prepare myself for that. I don't want yes. to clean up, but my choices are to clean up the dinosaurs or the bristle blocks. I love dinosaurs. I'm going to be a dinosaur leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really good. So if there's... Uh, one more thing I would like to, uh, I'm sorry, Marian, I Go thought ahead. coming to my, my mind is Go that ahead. I think you as a parent or as a teacher uh, sometimes will need to also be patient with such children who say no. Sometimes you have to just wait and watch and give them until they come up again and again. So, uh, you know, this is, this is what happens uh, with me, with my children. Sometimes when they say no, I, I give them some time on their own. Then definitely I tell them either you are going to choose or I will choose. So that, that's very, very important that you patiently not just or there is another instance sometimes that you just when there is no time or if you are running out of patience, then you uh, as a parent or a teacher force the child. No, no, no. I don't. You have to do this. Or, you know, so the, you have to be very, very patient and not jump onto that point where you give the direction and not give them time to take their decision. That's and also remember, very, very important, I feel. And remember that sometimes these children, the ones that push back, I can relate to this very much, um, are the children that are going to be the leaders mm -hmm. someday. So we have to take time to help them to learn to be a good leader and not be a bully about it. And yes. this is where it happens, you know, because they're pushing back. And as you say, that's something that we, we don't want to have happen at the moment because we just want to get this done. But mm -hmm. we realize like part of you is going, yes, yes. This, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So parents get nervous about that. Mm -hmm. um, and teachers get threatened by that because they're taking away some of my power by defying me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know I'm throwing this at you from left field, but this conversation is making me think of that. And I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on that, the child that is really going to grow up to be a leader. Yes, I have a couple of thoughts. I'm One sure. Do yeah. <laughs> it's an occupational hazard as an educator, right? Yeah. Um, so building on what you said, we ultimately want to empower our children to be flexible thinkers and problem solvers. And I have observed instances where some children will say no and try to negotiate and manipulate, and that leads to greater anxiety because they never know where the line really is. And in those instances, I encourage teachers and families hold the line the child will not like it for the first several instances, but they will come to trust and rely on it. In other instances, Important. I do think we need to hear children out. So for example, if we say to our child that they need to do their math homework and then they can watch TV and they have a tantrum, it's worthwhile to hear why they're upset. We, as the adult, assume that it's because we're telling them to do homework before watching TV. But if we stop, look and listen, we might hear that the child knows that the friends are gonna play Minecraft in an hour and a half. So can I do my math and my social studies and then I can do Minecraft until dinner time? Well, that gets all of the homework done sooner than we thought. It wasn't yes. something that we planned, but we also need to be open. As children become more rational negotiators, there's a place for that and a time for that but to hold space for their thoughts and feelings and their ideas. And their um, clocks. Ultimately, the whole purpose is getting, uh, I will say, um, the, the work is getting done. So yes. you want them to do your homework and you have to be that flexible, hear them out if there is a solution that they have in mind. Rather, 
as long as they finish their homework it's fine with me they right. can play for another 15 minutes they can watch tv they can play their friends they can go down and play in the park so whatever as long as because this is something that i want them to do and being flexible in the choices is also very important yes so, and this is where we stay true to the goal our yes. goal ought not to be to have power over children Children. Our goal yeah. is to stand in our power as their gentle Absolutely. leaders and to empower them, which Absolutely. speaks to the next point. So often, the only language children hear, especially from teachers, is directive language. Clean up, yes. time for lunch, playground's over. And I try to practice a five to one ratio of what I call noticing and narrating. for every one direction or redirection i'm going to give i will have made five positive noticing of their efforts or their ideas narrating what they're doing when i was in a classroom setting teaching my goal was for somebody to be able to stand outside my classroom with no window and know exactly what's going on because i was constantly narrating mary catherine you're building a tall tower evan look how you're dribbling that ball Peter thank you for sharing with Simon and that way when it's time to clean up that tower and that ball and whatever they're sharing we've invested in that relationship enough that there can be some flexibility in them following the direction but when we stay focused on how much power do i have over children we don't invest in that relationship we encourage them to be obstinate we feed yeah. the behavior rather than prevent it Yes, and I often um will explain to teachers that if a child is busy playing with something, they're building with blocks and you walk over and say, "All right, clean that up. I got to go." That is very interruptive, but if you take a moment and say, "Wow, what are you building? You've been here for like a half hour. Can you explain to me?" Well, we need to stop building now because it's time for lunch. Do you want to leave this here? Mhm. Mm Way later, or would you like me to give you time to put it away now? Perfect. Right? And wait for your choice. Right? And instead of having the child go, well, I I'm building. The child's thinking, this woman validated my work. <laughs> I'd do anything for her. Right? right. What perspective right. do you want from the child's yeah, mind? And and again, that also works with men. Oh. <laughs> I think structured choice works across the lifespan. Yeah, of females, yeah. Well, yes. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. Yes. It's so, a great tool for managers also, you know, oh, yes, managing your team. Absolutely. Absolutely. Managing your team, especially, you know, I think I I I mean I'm just recalling the earlier days when I had started working as a manager and I had a team to manage them who were uh, a bunch of youngsters, freshers I will say. completely novice to the work so they had these th that's a transition time for them you know they have been going to the college and suddenly they are into a under a boss where they have to do a certain work so they will give you all kind of excuses for being late and not doing things so giving them some you know the same strategy can work very well on uh, those kind of employees also yes true and so rebecca and one more thing rebecca while you were talking about this transition time of the child uh, accepting or you know uh, accepting one of the choices now that that's also very important you know because they are going through that transition of uh, when they have to make a particular decision out of these mm -hmm. choices that we have given them that's also very critical time when you have to talk you have to listen you have to have that communication with them and and once i think some things are very easy that if you've sorted some kind of arrangement that okay in the breakfast these are the choices and it's going to stay for almost a week then i think the one week is sorted so you know uh, it is better to give them these structured choices and work on them for a for a very easy life for everyone for the children yes. as well as the parent and also for their school so it's it's not only 
because you have a you have a aggressive child or you have a child who is very stubborn that you have to do this now this this is a this is something that you should do with every child for for their success so that you know they are able to do everything that you expect them to do in the class as well as, well as his own not necessarily you have to do only when you know that your child uh, does not listen to you or is not just agreeing to you it has you know you should practice this throughout so you know so that it's very easy for having a structured routine for a child so that's yes. also very important i hear you saying that it can be universal and it can be preventative and when parents reach out for coaching and they tell me my child is obstinate my child refuses my child is aggressive one of the first questions i'll ask is how do you give directions what is and is not a choice and how do you communicate that Usually, because in my experience yes, those parents very good, are very different they are authoritative <laughs> they give directions mostly they will do that because they have less time you know maybe they are working and they have less time to sort it out but again it's very important to sort it out it's a very important to give them structured uh, especially if you are working if you are working and you are not able to spend too much time it is very very important for you to mm -hmm. take that time out and sort it out and give them those choices so that you know their day their weeks and their months go seamlessly and they accomplish more during the time rather than just doing what they want to so it's very very important for the parents as well as educators teachers to do that um and another point there is when you said that it's less stressful for you and for the child it is also less stressful for the spectators the other yeah. child that is watching what's happening the other yeah. children in the room the spouse that is wondering what kind of reaction is dad going to get by doing this yeah. and so keep in mind that this has a big ripple effect. That's really profound. I'm so glad you shared that. It's so true. It is. And I it's occasionally get a profound thought. Oh, no, <laughs> thank you. But um, so all these wonderful ideas came out with this topic. And um, I know it, it was stirring my creative juices there as well. So thanks, Rebecca. I mean, I, I love all your um, strategies. They're, they're wonderful. Um, and they're simple. You know, you don't have to go read a complicated book or watch yeah. a video. Just do this. Say that. Is it that easy? Yes. Rebecca says yes. It's that easy. <laughs> so could you, in closing, share some of your top strategies for implementing structured choices and structured questions? Sure. I have seen structured choice transform life at home and life in the classroom. At home, when parents give structured choice about what they're going to wear to school, often the night before the decision is made, the clothes are laid out, it makes the morning routine easier. Uh, yeah. Meal time, instead of being a short order cook, you define what and when food is available and children define if and how much they eat. Music mm. in the car, siblings fighting. Are we going to listen to Old MacDonald or ABC? And those are the choices. Instead of going through the whole, you know, repertoire of what they want, and oh, then the siblings please. end up battling. Excuse me, because you're going to go through more. So just right there on that one. And from my opinion, it would not be a good choice to fix that by having them each put on their own set of headphones. Right. This is a life lesson that sometimes there's a community voice and we both learn to listen to it and yes. our choices are on what terms we listen to it or perhaps what order we listen to it. But you raise a really good point, Marin, is that we try to simplify challenges to stop the discomfort. But yes. our children can't learn to cope with discomfort if we constantly keep them comfortable. They can't learn to regulate if they never get dysregulated. So, so part of my mission in coaching teachers and parents is to empower them to be able to deal with their feelings about children's feelings so that they can help children deal with their actual feelings. Wonderful. So I didn't mean to interrupt. So you were talking about music, 
and you were really doing a good order. So sorry. So this is what what helps at home. It it helps with getting dressed. It helps with meal time. It helps with transitions. It helps with bedtime. In the classroom, I've seen so much more leadership through structured choice. When it's time to clean up, are you going to be a dinosaur leader or a Lego leader? Who doesn't want to be a leader? It makes it so much easier. Or when we use structured choice and an element of flexibility during a stressful time, mm, it's time to go inside. Are we going to line up like a snake or like a very hungry caterpillar? Mm -hmm. So again, there's an element of choice while also communicating that expectation. And when teachers feel empowered with structured choice, they're better able to communicate what's not a choice. I hear a lot less of the, okay, we're gonna do this, okay, buddy. He's not your buddy. He's your child or he's your student. And it's important for there to be a boundary there. If you're asking permission to give a direction, then we need to reality check that relationship. That's awesome. I'm, I'm encourage any of you watching, if you have a question on something specific, please, now's your time to post it. Um, you know, Rebecca travels many places to give this advice and help people. And you have an opportunity right now through this wonderful community to talk with her directly and get some help. So please, if you have a question, we have about three or four minutes left. So Preeti has a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So she says, uh, is there a time or age when this strategy should stop? Ooh, that's a really good question. I, my premonition is that we hope that by introducing structured choice early, that children will learn to structure their own choices. We're teaching them the executive functioning, the thinking about thinking, to be able to structure their own choices. So by late elementary school, middle school, they're able to say, I need to do A, B, and C. Am I gonna do A first or B first? But again, this also works across the lifeline. In my family, we have the rule of three when it comes to choosing where we're gonna go out to eat, when it's safe to go out to eat, instead of asking everyone, well, where do you wanna go? And where do you wanna go? The person who is ultimately going to make the decision gives three choices and then we can weigh in. And when people, well, I don't really wanna go there. Well, your choices are A, B, and C. And when we get there and somebody refuses to order off the menu, they're entitled to feel upset about that, but still the choices are A, B, and C. Very and, good. Uh, Would it make children- has another, another question that's the extension to the same question that what would it make children used to a particular habit before making a decision? Now, the first question was that, is there a time or age when the strategy should stop? Mm. Would it make children used to a particular habit before making a decision? I hear. Okay. So again, this is the executive functioning and the metacognition, the thinking about thinking. When our children are able, we can return the choice to them. Ugh. Yeah, I heard you say that you've got math, history, and science. What do you think you're going to do first? Like, it's kind of a structured choice because we're reiterating the three things that need to get happen, that need to happen, but we're also returning kind of the I trust you to choose. The child is now taking responsibility. I think it's a great way to train brains to make decisions. Yes. It is. It is. I completely agree. I think it's you know, some of the great thoughts and points you've given in the conversation today. Marian? Yes, I... That you would... um, actually, I think, and you may both be shocked to hear this, that I am done talking. I, <laughs> I loved everything you had to say. I like how it stimulated my brain to start thinking as well. And um, you know, it's reassuring too, like you learn these things and then you kind of forget about them. Mm -hmm. and then you're talking about them and it's like, yes, you know, but then you add your own just Rebecca spin on it, which makes <laughs> it a little bit more interesting. So thank you so much. Uh, please continue to post your knowledge and questions on the group because we, the group definitely learns from you. 
And, and I uh, learned from the group. I am so grateful for the opportunity to celebrate my role as a lifelong learner, not just a teacher. And exactly. that group facilitates it. If I may, I wanted to share one more point. May I? Okay. Oh, please. Yes. Excellent. One of the best ways to illustrate structured choice is actually with visual. So I often create choice boards. And this one I created on the fly in a classroom. It says choice with a finger pointing and then arts and crafts or books. And you can use picture symbols or pictures of the child actually doing the actions. But this clearly communicates the choice. And this little kid liked carrying around his choice board and his favorite thing to play with was magnetiles. So he was highly motivated to use the choices on here because it meant he got to carry around magnetiles. Using visuals such as this also increases children's independence. Rather than constantly verbally reiterating what the choices are, check your choice board, check your schedule, they're able to take greater responsibility as they become more independent. So one more toolbox in your strategy box. Yes. Fantastic. Excellent. That's an excellent tool that you have given us. I think <clears throat> it will really make a difference uh, if you actually put it on the board and give it to them or they mm -hmm. get to see it every day. Yes. You know, that this is the choice that you have now. You decide. So yeah, and I you think know this is this is this is one of the strategies that can be used to actually develop interest in a particular subject if the child does not love mm. doing that subject very right. important otherwise the child is always going to be going into a particular direction i don't want to you know uh, learn to write i'm i only love to dance and sing so you know this is something what, that can really help them and what i'm going to do because you've inspired me to want to do this um if anyone would like a song to help teach about choices. I am going to post it as a free download. I, I thought you were going to sing it. I have put it <laughs> on the, you have a guitar and why don't you do a couple of lines? I can do a couple of lines, but you know, I can do it a cappella. Do it, you know, um, it's choices. Cho I have choices, choices, choices of what I'd like to do. I have choices, choices, and so do you. I can choose what color to use, blue or red. I could choose to take a nap on the floor or in my bed. I could choose, choose to laugh. I could choose to cry. It's up to me because I have choices. And then there's another wow. verse. So, so I would like to... That's actually the whole subject. So you have, Marion, you have a song on almost everything. Yes, it's I a soundtrack of my life. I am, there is not even a single episode. And let me tell our audience who are watching, maybe what, please go back and see all the videos and everything. You know, Marion has a song for almost everything. And it's my amazing. passion. Amazing. Uh, I am. Um... Oh, thanks, Preeti. I think you're pretty awesome, too. And um, I just think that it's really good for children to hear this. And um, the song is sung by children because it's not my voice that they hear. Okay. It's hearing children saying about their choices. And um, so, Rebecca, I would, you know, like anytime I can marry a song with one of your lessons, I love I to love do it. that because, and please feel free to share. I'm not somebody that goes, hey, you didn't pay for that. No, I'm more like, I wrote it so children can benefit from it. Exactly. So yes. enjoy. And thank you for your wonderful, wonderful lesson today. It was thank great. Thank you for learning together. This is so exciting. Yes, we did. We did, and and I told too such a good insight from a parent of uh, eight year old twins that are, I'm sure, testing their boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> All right, amazing! I think we had a wonderful time today, friends, and I hope this discussion was definitely beneficial for us because we got so many learnings and ideas how to give structured choices to small children and how why should we give structured choices for 
them to accomplish more thank you rebecca once again for joining thank us today you. thank you so much and i also thank marian for her time especially to this global community almost every day you spend a lot of time in helping us expand this group i also thank all the viewers on facebook for taking your precious time out to watch this show live best wishes to all of you until we meet again next week thank you bye bye